Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Este es Luis Alberto Jovel desde Australia, trayéndole notas teológicas. Y en esta mañana le voy a traer uno de los, eh, como dicen en Latinoamérica, uno de los capos del de estudio bíblico. Eh, él es especializado en el Antiguo Testamento y su nombre es Michael Heiser. Hello, Mike. How are you? Very good. How are you? Well, I'm very good here. Are you awake? <laughs> yes, I've been awake for the last maybe 25 Uh, minutes and it's 4:40 here a.m. in Australia, and I believe it's 11:40 over there in in Washington State. That's correct. Yes. Yes, Mike. Uh, I'm very glad to have you in this podcast, and um, and I'm very looking forward what you're gonna uh, say. Um, but first of all, let, tell us something about yourself. I mean, I, I was gonna write, I, I had here your bio, but I'd rather hear it from you, from the source. Mm -hmm. Well. Um... How can I do this and not put your audience to sleep? Mm. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a, my field is Hebrew Bible and Semitic languages. I have a couple of graduate degrees, including a PhD in that from University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, I finished that in 2004. Since 2004, up until a few weeks ago, I was the scholar in residence uh, for Logos Bible Software. Uh, I'm actually changing positions. I, I, I have changed. We just haven't moved yet. Uh, I'm going to be moving to Jacksonville, Florida to start a school of theology that focuses on the kind of content that I do on the podcast and in books like Unseen Realm and Supernatural. It's going to be run through a local church. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be accredited, but it's going to be open to the public. Um, Our, our aim is to, you know, give people a, a good grounding in biblical theology uh, with a, you know, paying attention to the supernatural worldview and <clears throat> reading scripture from its original context so that they uh, they get grounded and, and, you know, have that as a foundation to do ministry on. So that's what we're going to be transitioning to. But I've, I've written several books, uh, Unseen Realm, you know, it's been, you know, widely sold and, Lots of articles for Bible Study Magazine. I, I try to do things intentionally for uh, the layperson and the local church, in addition to writing academic things, because I think the normal person, a person who's not a specialist, uh, can handle good content. Um, I think we, I think we need to stop underestimating the appetite for content uh, in the church. So, that's in a nutshell. That's what I like to do. Yes, and, and what what you're doing, I remember that uh, sometimes it takes a long time from, for academic topics to get in the mainstream mm -hmm. uh, because they're very esoteric. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And uh, but what you're doing and through Unseen Realm, that's the, that's the first book I, I I had it like three times at work. I'm in the freezer, so I can I, I can listen to whatever I want. So so I go back and go back to it, and uh, and you have a a a more accessible book. Uh, supernatural, mm -hmm. um, right? And, and both books have really helped me and, and confirm many of the things that I that, that I believe. But uh, but they were very difficult for other academics to put into words that people from the in the pew can understand. And that's the, the, that's the main aim that I can see in you, Mike. And thank you for that because because uh, it makes people like me um, easy. Uh, it simplifies the preaching. <laughs> that's Yeah, well, that, that's that's what we're trying to do. Uh, there's a, a follow-up book on angels. Again, it's kind of like Unseen Realm. It's it's academic, but hopefully still readable. And then uh, there's going to be one on demons, that the powers of darkness that comes out next year. So that's that's the goal anyway. You know, try to put out academic material and have it be readable and digestible to people who don't have degrees and. Mm. You're not going to remember everything, but nobody does, you know. Yeah. So don't don't worry about that. Just you know, absorb as much content as you can, a little bit every day, and you know, a year or two down the road, you'll be, you know, you'll be really solid with that. Yes, I, I did uh, a last the last part of your book on angels. I did a, a, a Spanish speaking um, not, well, presentation, like uh, 30 minutes, mm -hmm. and to tell the truth, that's what I invited you. Also, I mean, I, I did it after I invited you, but uh, um, the the podcast, the, that that episode became a bit viral because a lot of people mm -hmm. were interested in knowing, wow. and, a lot of, and the main complaint was, Mike, 
why angels don't have wings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That was the, oh, main, wow. the main complaint. <laughs> it's a lie. Angels do have wings. I said, okay, which ones? Seraphim and cherubim. Yeah, but they're not angels. <laughs> they're all the it's categories. Job, just, just, yeah. Yes, so so that was the main complaint. I had a lot of people saying that I was wrong, that I was teaching heresy <laughs> because angels didn't have wings. There anyway. you go. If, if that's the worst you do, then you're not going to cause much trouble. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. People don't know what the heresy is, apparently. But anyway, well, uh, we have some questions here um, and some topics that uh, well, we're going to talk about angels as well. But, uh, but the first one is... Um, about the divine council, sons of God and gods and angels. And in your work, Dr. Heiser, you had argued that other gods mentioned in the Bible are real. That is, there are other divine beings called gods apart from Yahweh, the God of Israel. How, how can we understand this in the light of the concept of monotheism? And this is another topic that I talk about, uh, but I, I would like you to say it because I, cause I get sure. all my sources from you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, the the reason we we think that you know plural Elohim, plural you know gods in the Hebrew Bible, and they they show up in a number of passages. The reason we think that either that's troublesome, and we're only talking about idols or even other people, other humans. The reason we shy away from that is because we we make a fundamental mistake. We assume that a word like Elohim necessarily refers to, and all these words are important, okay, that, that it necessarily refers to a unique set of attributes. Okay, so if Elohim is tied to a unique set of attributes like omniscience, omnipotence, self-existence, you know, these attributes that we know the Bible attributes to only the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, then we can't have more than one Elohim because then you'd have other Elohim with those attributes. And and that would be correct. But the problem is, is that Elohim doesn't refer to a unique set of attributes. And you say, well, how do we know that? We know that because the biblical writers use the word Elohim of things that are not the God of Israel. Okay, Things like the deities of put over the nations in Deuteronomy 32.8 or Deuteronomy 32.17. Things like the, uh, you know, the, the, the deceased human dead in 1 Samuel 28.13. Okay, the, these other entities are lesser than the God of the Bible. And so the fact that they're called Elohim should tell you that, oh, well, the biblical writer wouldn't be using Elohim if he was thinking of a unique set of attributes. So maybe Elohim means something different. Maybe we've made a mistake on how we understand that word. And I argue that, yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, Psalm 82 is just point blank. It says in Hebrew, Elohim that Adat El, Elohim God, the singular God, capital G, God, has taken his place in the divine council. And it's one God. It's the unique God because of the verb. It's a participle, actually. It's a singular. So Elohim, singular, has taken his place in the divine council. And then the next line is, Becher of Elohim Yishpot, in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. There are other Elohim that the, the big Elohim, the first Elohim, is, is going to be passing judgment on. So this can't be the Trinity because the Trinity isn't corrupt. Verses 2 through 5 in Psalm 82 tell us why God is judging the other Elohim. So we have multiple Elohim. It, it's, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. You get down to verse 6. He said, I, you know, the speaker who is God in the scene, I said, you are gods, you are Elohim Sons, plural, of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. These are lesser supernatural beings. You know, when when God says in, in Exodus 12 that this night, you know, the night of the Passover, you know, I will I will have victory over, I will judge the gods of Egypt. Does he mean it? Because if the gods are just pieces of stone, well, you and I could judge them too. We just take a you know, a jackhammer or a club to the thing and break it up. You don't need a Passover. You just need a, you know, a hammer and a chisel. When, when the Bible says that, that Yahweh of Israel is the God of all gods, is it lying? 
No, I, what I'm saying is it means exactly what it says. You know, the, the, the gods are not idols. Okay, God doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't work with idols because elsewhere in the, these Elohim, if you go to Psalm 89, these Elohim are faithful members of God's counsel, his entourage. You know, they're not evil. They're not wicked. Okay, God doesn't work with idols. He doesn't work with supernatural beings in rebellion. They are cast off. They are set aside. They are they are adversaries now. They're not on the payroll. Uh, you know, they're just they're not also not humans because this, the the council in Psalm eighty nine, which uses the same wording as we saw in Psalm eighty two, the council is quote in the skies, Bashakach, in the skies, in the heavens. Okay, these are not a bunch of Jewish elders. You don't have Jewish elders ruling the spiritual world or the skies with God. It doesn't make any sense at all. But this is how people have have interpreted plural Elohim. They either make them people or they make them idols, and it just doesn't work. You don't have idols in heaven either in the skies. Mm. It doesn't work. And, but the reason there's this impulse to, to really come up with goofy interpretations is because people are afraid to put an S on the end of G-O-D because they think that Elohim, the Hebrew word that would produce you know, gods, they think that it, it's tied into a specific set of unique attributes, but it's not. All Elohim really means, the reason why it's used of different things, including God, but also things that are less than God, is Elohim just ref- is a term you would use to speak of something that by nature is a disembodied spirit being in the spiritual world. That's all it is. That's why it's a common term. God is an Elohim, but not a, but none of the other Elohim are him. Mm. They're the same class in, in terms of where they live, so to speak, you know, what their, what their domain is. But in that domain, there is difference. You know, there is only one Yahweh. He is unique. Yes, and, and I there think is hierarchy and power. And I think that that's where people, are, they, some people come back and they quote me, like, for example, Isaiah 44, 6, mm-hmm. where it says, that's the, that says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I'm the first and I'm the last, besides me, there is no God. And people say, no, there cannot be other gods, there's only one God. Right. These are these are statements of incomparability, not statements that other gods don't exist, mm. because then you'd have a hopeless contradiction in the Bible. Yes. Uh, what I like to do is I like to go to Deuteronomy four and Deuteronomy thirty two, because in both of those chapters, you have this you have this phrase besides me, there's no other or something like that. But also in those passages, you have the affirmation that there are other gods. Mm. So it, it, it's either hopelessly contradictory if you think. This, this wording means the other gods don't exist. Now you've got a big problem. You got the biblical writer can't make up his mind. Mm-hmm. They either do exist or they don't. You know, which one is it? You can't have both. Yes. But if, if the statements mean that there's, there's one that is incomparable, that is unique among the other Elohim. Well, then, then it works just fine. And we, and we know this is the case. I mean, I don't, I don't, address this much in Unseen Realm. I have a journal article, a scholarly journal article where I do this. Where, and it comes from my dissertation. My dissertation, I point out that there, there are about 11 variations of this phrase. There's none besides me. There's none like me. Something like that. And in all of the contexts in which they uh, occur, you have incomparability being the point. And, and the way that's easily verified is there, it, the, these phrases occur twice once in Isaiah and once in uh, Zephaniah of um, cities. Babylon, for instance, says at one place, there's none besides me. Mm. And Nineveh says, there's none besides me. So in other words, the, the biblical writer you know, is saying that, hey, you know, the, the, the folks at Nineveh believe there are no other cities in the world. No other cities exist. That's ridiculous. Mm. You know, it's absurd. You, you know, you travel a few miles down the road, you hit one. You know, it, it just, it's ridiculous. There's this thing called trade and warfare. Of course they know other cities exist. The point is that Babylon and Nineveh are claiming to be incomparable, to be the best, mm. to be untouchable. Yes. You know, that, that's the point. So these phrases do not mean to say that the other gods don't exist. 
that means that Yahweh is incomparable. And before him, before him, the text is correct. There was no other because it is God who creates all things in heaven and in earth, in the spiritual world and the physical world. He is the only one who is pre-existent to all other things. Mm. So the, the text is correct. There's, there's no problem here. The only problem is one that develops when we think that Elohim is about attributes and we think that besides me there's no other. It means non-existence instead of incomparability. This, this issue about how reading the scripture, and this is this just, just a, not a topic, but but it's the same as God's sovereignty that people, and, and you talk about this in, 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 um, in, um, in your book, and in realm, mm-hmm. that people don't see that uh, individuals have agency as well. So they yeah. read, they read those verses in in, uh, in the book of in the book of Psalms that says that Yahweh is, is has total control, and they neglect those verses where even Yahweh speaking says, "I didn't have this on my mind, <laughs> I didn't command you to do this." Right, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and even even further, the the fact that God foreknows something doesn't mean that it was destined or predestined. Yeah. You know, in, in in unseen realm, I I. Go to First Samuel twenty-three for that, where God foreknows two things that never happen. Mm-hmm. So By definition, they, they, His foreknowledge did not necessitate their predestination because they don't happen. Yes, yes. You know, I mean, th- these are obvious things, but they're easy to read over and not really think about. And if we're sort of trying to define or defend a particular theological view, in some cases, we're never even exposed. You know, to the to the ways that this doesn't work. Yes, like, and just to finish this point, uh, I quoted a, a verse from Galatians: uh, where whatever you you um, you plant, that's what you sow. So it doesn't mm-hmm. mean that God. It, there, even Paul quotes that. So there, yeah, things happen because you make them happen. And then somebody came back and said, "No, oh, what about God's sovereignty?" And I said, "But what about this verse? <laughs> How do you read this verse as well? I mean, yeah. uh, you, you're." You're trying to, and I said at the end, you're working with a canon within the canon, and that's what people do. Yeah, yeah, that's there, there's a lot of that. It's it's unfortunate. So monotheism, but, so you know, mon- that's yeah. what it is. Yes, so monotheism. We're still monotheists, <laughs> aren't we? Yeah, there 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 is there is only one, you know, there's only one Yahweh. There's only one. You know, ultimate God of the Bible and God of the universe. You know, there, and you know the the distinction between the God of the Bible and all the other Elohim. You don't, you can't derive the distinction from a, from the word Elohim because Elohim has nothing to do with these specific set of unique attributes. Where we get our theology there is from descriptions in the Bible about that one particular Elohim. You know, that he is omniscient, omniscient, pre-existent, you know, omnipotent, all that kind of stuff. And, and in fact, those descriptions are denied to mm-hmm. other Elohim. Yes. So our theology is, is about the uniqueness of the God of the Bible. There's only one of those is exegetically defensible. We just don't get that information from the word Elohim. We get it from lots of other passages. I, I think that also in Latin America, because this is this is um, focused on Latin American um, audience. Uh, the issue is that we have a very <coughs> big problem with Unitarianism in Latin America, mm-hmm. and extremely big, uh, Mike. Uh, they are very strong. They are like the competitors of Pentecostalism, actually, and and they always talk about the strictly monotheism in the Old Testament. And I said, I always tell them. If you say that, you don't know anything about Old Testament Judaism or, or, or is, is Israel's faith. They didn't. They, it was until Maimonides, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember how to say that, the name, until the 13th century that he introduced that, that he even went as far, I don't know if you, if you, know, if you are aware of this, but he went as far as to deny any other spiritual beings apart from God. Yeah, um, Ach- Achnaten, yeah. Yes. So, so yeah. So, but but he left room he left room for his own de- his own deity. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I, I'm God too because I'm Pharaoh. Yes, <laughs> so there were two. I know. Uh, and he had a weird a, a weird head as well. They they and, and comes to your in, in, into your realm, Mike. That they thought that he was a that people think that he he, he was an alien or something because of the 
the yeah, way they drew yeah. them. But anyway, it's all. Well, you, you know, you know that the, it's it's bigger than Egypt, though, too. Mm-hmm. You know, in you know, in, in Unseen Realm, I I talk a lot about the, you know, how God appears. There there are two Yahwehs, two Yahweh figures. Yes. I mean, there's only one Him, but there's two figures. One is invisible and transcendent. The other one is appears as a man. Uh, so I, I spend three chapters in the book, you know, going through the, these passages, and sometimes they're in the same scene. Mm. And in Genesis 48, they're even fused together with the same verb. Mm. You know, I mean, there, there's 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 a Godhead kind of thinking in the Old Testament, where you have the you know you, the this angel, the the Malach Adonai, the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, is God but isn't. He is God, but he's yet. He's also his own distinct person. And, and you know, people say, well, that, you're just getting that from, like, Christianity and injecting it back in the Old Testament. No, it's the other way around. The, the Christians got it from their Old Testament. And and it's even wider than that because, it, I don't know, I don't know your audience. I mean, maybe someone in the audience would, would enjoy this book. But there's a book by a, a Jewish fellow named Benjamin Summer called The Bodies of God. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, he's not an evangelical, so I'm not going to endorse everything he, he says in there. But the book is, he'll say things point blank in the book. Now, this is a Jew. He'll say things like the idea of, of, of a trinity is perfectly compatible with the Hebrew Bible. And he's a, he's a Jewish theology prep professor. He's a biblical studies professor at a Jewish seminary in New York. Mm. And he goes back into the Assyrian and the Akkadian uh, material to show that, look, ancient people – could conceive, they could think on these terms, that you had gods who could be more than one person at the same time and in different places. Mm-hmm. They, they were the same, but yet they were different. And that's all I'm arguing for, like in the Old Testament. They had these categories. There was God, and then this, the one that comes as a man, the angel, typically. I mean, there are other the word of the Lord is another title. The name of the Lord is another title. But you had, you have God. You have this. You have the same God, but now a different person coming as a man. And you also get the Spirit, you know, looped into this. And when you get to the New Testament, Jesus becomes the central focus of this because he, they've, they've had this sort of prototype, you know, God as man in the Old Testament, and now we get the incarnation with Jesus. And, and Jesus is, is linked to God, but he's also different, and he's also linked to the Spirit. You know, Paul says twice, the Lord who is the Spirit. Well, he, he doesn't mean that Jesus is the Spirit, but he's the same mm. person, but or the same, you know, essence, but the different person. You know, this is where Trinitarianism actually comes from. It comes from this very ancient notion that you can have deities who are what they are, but they could be more than one person at the same time. Egypt had triads like this. So did the Akkadians, the Assyrians. Now they don't they don't articulate the relationship the same way that the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament does. But they had these categories. They they could think on these terms. And so Unitarians, in in my experience, and it, I'll, I'll confess it's pretty limited, but Unitarians are completely unaware of these other contexts. It's like they're they're not even on the radar. They're just yeah. used to kind of making the sort of proof texting arguments that they make, and they don't have these wider contexts of which the Hebrew Bible was part, and then of course the New Testament. No, so yeah, well that, that, that's what I always tell them. Uh, and to tell you one thing, you always uh, mention Alan Siegel. Um, uh, the two powers of heaven. Yes, yeah, Siegel is another one. Yeah. Yep, two powers and, in heaven. And I another mentioned, Jew. I mentioned that on my on my um, audios, and three days afterwards, it was running around on a PDF. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so, people were so. I mean, that, uh, it's bad to do that, but but my point is that people are so interested in this point that uh, that uh, they, there, there's another there's another really good article. I don't know if it's if it's accessible online or not, but Daniel Boyerin, that's B-O-Y-A-R-I-N, he has an article called The Gospel of the Memra. He's a, a, a rabbinic professor. He's Jewish, obviously. He's a rabbinic professor at, at the University of California in Berkeley. But he's another one that just tracks on this, you know, Godhead, Trinitarian, you know, sort of thinking. 
And it's not foreign to the ancient world. It's not, it wasn't even foreign to the Jewish community mm. until the second century when they, they declared it a heresy. They, they, they changed their theology in response to, to Christianity in, in many respects. And that's what Siegel's book about, you know, is about when this used to be perfectly acceptable thinking. When did that change? And so he wrote Two Powers in Heaven and, you know, found that in yeah. the second century things changed, you know. Mm. But, you know, the Unitarian crowd just typically is not even aware of, of, again, the data, and they're not aware of the academic discussion going on as we speak about the data. Mm. Yes, I mean, uh, they're they're not aware of how Jews believed during the time of Jesus, what what their beliefs were. So uh, so it's, um, it's it's very sad to talk to some people who have done theological studies, but they still lack lack that knowledge it's like it doesn't exist well